Okay. Off-season topic. Haven't talked about it much since the year ended, although it's getting pretty relevant with the deadline for qualifying offers coming up in a few days now. Teoscar Hernandez. He either will or will not be given the qualifying offer by the Mariners, so we're going to sit here and dissect should they give it to him. And before we do, we should note, in their end-of-season press conference, Jerry said the organization internally has already made the decision on what they will do with Teoscar in the qualifying offer. They just haven't made it public yet. So, before we publicly know, we're going to sit here and talk about Should they offer it to him? I think they should offer it to him. What do you think? I'm kind of one foot in, one foot out. I wrote an article about this. It's over on JustBaseball.com if you want to check it out. But I think there's some pros and cons to both. You were more adamant, though, that when we talked about this pre-recording, that they should do it. I think they should do it because, first of all, uh, a one-year $20 million price tag, I think in the grand scheme of things, really isn't that much. The qualifying offer this year is $20.5 million. That, that is the high out of the now 11 year stretch of the qualifying offer. But I mean, it's it all it is, is the it's the mean of the top 125 paid players in baseball. That's all it is. So obviously, it's going to rise every year as long as player contracts rise. The qualifying qualifying offer will uh, will raise as well. There's only 13 out of 124 players that have been offered the qualifying offer have accepted 13 out of 124. That's a, a hair over 10%. I think about this as best case, maybe not best case, but there's one case where you get Teoscar back at a one-year $20.5 million deal, and he gets essentially a prove-it deal at a higher average annual value than he would get on the open market, and he has a chance to reset his market for next offseason. And I think the other one, other side of this is, is he rejects it. He goes back to the East Coast. He goes back and plays in the AL East. He gets his offensive numbers back up and ballparks. He likes hitting in better. And the Mariners get a draft pick out of it. And I, th- I think both of those are feasible because if he does accept it, Mariners have one proven outfield bat next year. That's Julio Rodriguez. That's it. That's the only one on the roster. So getting another proven bat back doesn't really seem like the end of the world, even if it's for the price tag of twenty and a half million dollars, and that still leaves the door open to go do other things. So before I get into any of my personal reasons, let me just ask you this. The Mariners almost traded Teo at the deadline. Does that feel like a team that is just itching to give him the qualifying offer for twenty and a half million dollars? But the the qualifying offer it doesn't even you can hedge a qualifying offer on if the player banking that the player is going to reject. The Angels are going to offer Shohei Otani the qualifying offer this year. Yeah. Is he going to take it? No. No, he's not taking it. I think that's a little different. Everybody knows not only is Shohei going to reject it, but he's going to go play somewhere else. Teoscar Hernandez is kind of on the line here in terms of would he accept it, would he not? Because... I don't think he's getting more than 20 and a half million AAV on the market. So if they offer that to him, he may think about wanting to take another prove it deal and then hit the market again. I've come to the conclusion that I don't think Teoscar Hernandez wants to play next season in Seattle. If that is the case and the Mariners firmly believe that, I think it's a no brainer. You offer it to him. You know why? Here's the, here's this breakdown for the draft picks you get. If you're the player you offer, rejects the qualifying offer. So there's it's broken into to three different categories. It's competitive balance tax teams, it's revenue sharing recipients, and then all other teams that don't qualify for either of those. Competitive balance tax um, payers are the teams that are over this competitive balance tax, the Padres, the Mets, et cetera, the Yankees, the Angels. Those teams all qualify for that. The revenue sharing recipients are the teams that receive more money from Major League Baseball than give to it in their revenue sharing. The third tier is all the other teams that do not qualify for that. They are under the luxury tax, but they are over the they are not revenue sharing teams. So the 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 breakdown, by the way, uh, you know where the Mariners land in that list? Uh MLB.com put out a breakdown as like these are the preliminary classifications for each team that will determine the draft picks they receive, whether for a departing player or for a player they sign with a qualifying offer. 
Uh, these classifications will be qualified once the competitive balance tax payrolls are determined in early December. The Mariners land, laugh all you want, in the revenue-sharing recipients, which means they receive more money from the revenue-sharing pool of Major League Baseball than, the, than they give out. They, what? That, that's where they land. And so if Teoscar Hernandez goes out on the free agent market and signs a deal that is worth more than $50 million, the Mariners get a first-round pick at the end of the first round. That's what they get. They, they will get a first-round pick if he goes and signs a deal that's worth at least $50 million elsewhere. And I think if Teoscar Hernandez is going back to the AL East, I think somebody is going to give him a three-year deal that's worth more than $50 million. So uh, Spotrack, by the way, thinks he is worth four years and $66.3 million. That right there is a first-round pick if somebody else gives him that. The first round pick would be really, really valuable. And again, there are reasons to offer it to him, not just that you get the draft pick and potentially a first round pick if he declines it, but we know his hard hit profile was still really good. So in that regard, there's still a chance he has a bounce back year, even if it's in Seattle next year, and he does take that qualifying offer. And he still had he still hit 25 home runs. He could still up his war next year. He played a little bit better defense than he did in 2022. So it's, it wasn't all negative with Teo. Here's my only question again. So we're kind of on two opposite sides of this. And this is not what I would do. I hope the Mariners spend all the money in the world this offseason. I hope there is no limit on that payroll budget. But we know realistically that's not true. So we talked about a little bit pre-recording, and and we're going to bring it up here now. If Teoscar were to take that qualifying offer, the Mariners are currently 16th in payroll. He takes that $20.5 million million AAV qualifying offer, goes to 13. 13's honestly a little higher than the Mariners have been in payroll across the league in a while, and they usually don't go all that much higher than that. I think we know John Stanton has very little interest in being a top 10 club in payroll in Major League Baseball. So if that's the case, here's why I'm a little on edge again. There's a part of me that feels like the Mariners get one move in free agency this winter. It's one. Whether that's Shohei, whether that's Blake Snell, whether that's somebody else, you get one move because if you get Blake Snell, for example, he will probably demand a, about 21 to $24 million AAV. So a little bit more than this QO for Teo. And if that's the case, that pushes him toward 12th or 13th in payroll. If that's not the case, then, then great. If it's not the case and they're willing to spend more money, then great. But if it is the case then it feels like Teo taking the qualifying offer could put a wrench in some of their plans to spend in free agency. Because again, in my head, it feels like they're getting one move in free agency. I think Teoscar Hernandez would have a market because there's been some less proven hitters over the years that have gotten multi-year deals. I mean, Kyle Schwarber got what? He got a four-year deal. Didn't he with the Phillies? Yeah. And who, like, if you were to take Teoscar last year and Kyle Schwarber and put him out on the open market each who's who's getting a who's got a better market that's a good question it it is probably Teo because his track record from 2020 to 2022 was as good as almost anybody's in baseball especially amongst the power hitters he plays more defense than Schwarber he well he runs a little bit better than Schwarber maybe not that much better he still gets thrown out on the bases a lot Teo but better than Kyle Schwarber so that's a fair point. Maybe somebody would give Teo a four-year deal. You know, you keep talking about AL East teams. The team I outlined is a pretty good fit in my article that I wrote. I feel like the Reds are a team that could really use them. They're yeah. right on the brink now. They need bats. Very hitter-friendly park. You had Stuart Fairchild playing nearly 100 games for the Reds last year. A lot of that being in the outfield, meaning there is room for Teoscar Hernandez there. That could be another spot that he would land. And maybe the Reds would be a team to give him a four-year $62 million deal or something like that. The Mariners could also very well know by now they could have talked to Teoscar's agent and realized that he does not want to re-sign with them. That like that's entirely a real a realistic possibility. So if that's the case, like this isn't even a hesitation, right? It's not. You 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 offer it to him if that's the case. Because even if that number is twenty and a half million dollars, Teoscar Hernandez knows that if he wants to set him out for set him up for better perception for the rest of his career. He's going to play baseball somewhere else. He's not playing it in Seattle. We, we've we all seen those home road splits. And, and Teoscar made sure that people saw those home road splits when he when he liked uh, liked to tweet about it. So, th- like, that's that's always uh, 
that's always an option here. I think there's another angle to this too, where if the Mariners say go after Blake Snell in free agency, the Padres have two options for a qualifying offer. They can offer a qualifying offer to Josh Hader, or they can offer a qualifying offer to Blake Snell. Blake Snell has a qualifying offer attached to him. The draft pick washes out and you don't lose anything by signing him by offering Teoscar Hernandez one as well. And that's a good point. It feels like they will offer it to Snell over Hater. It's just starter versus reliever value wise. It feels like you'd offer it to the starter. So that is a good point. And to your previous point about if they already know that Teoscar is going to test the free agent market, then yes, you absolutely offer it to him. You absolutely give him the qualifying offer and let him decline it because he knows by this point what the qualifying offer is. He knows if he takes it, he'd get $20.5 million if the Mariners have offered it. So I'm sure him and his agent have well thought it out and well made their decision on what they'd want to do. And we don't know yet. Again, it's not public yet. But from the information we currently have, that it just feels to me he would be a player that might consider it. If I had to go one way or another, I'd guess no. Again, I I just don't love the idea of if you all of a sudden have to pay him $20 million and then all of a sudden it probably feels like you're cutting into John Stanton's precious little payroll budget and maybe foil some plans for signing other guys. But you're right. If if, if you think he's going to decline it, give it to him. You know, the Mariners have only offered the qualifying offer twice ever. It's been it's been around 11 years, but it's only been twice in 11 years. Once was. Hasashi Wakuma, and the other time was was Kendrys Morales when he left after uh, 2013. That's it. Yeah, and after 2013, it was probably about fair value. It, it wasn't. It wasn't 20 and a half million dollars back then. I think it was closer to like 12. I think it was like 13 ish back then. 13 or 14. I was gonna say 12. So yeah, that that sounds about right. And that would be a little different if it was still at a 13 million dollar AAV, the QO. I would say yeah, give it to Teo, no doubt. I, I, I guess my hesitation here is just 20 is a lot. A 1.8 F war from last year does not equal $20.5 million of value. That would equal about 15, not 20 and a half. And we know he had his issues here. Walk rate was down. Strikeout rate was up. He's a fine defender. He's not a great defender. He's not a great base runner. So like, I'm actually not opposed to the idea of if he hits the free agent market and then if the price is right, you could bring him back on a more team-friendly deal. If he was to take some three-year deal here for 42-ish million dollars, similar to the deal Mitch got with the Giants, I'd be more open to that. But the $20.5 million AAV, I just kind of squirm in my seat a little bit. I just don't love it. But you're okay with multiple years for him over just one? If it's for a little bit less money... And some of the markets played out again. So if they were to bring Teoscar back, I think it's with the idea that they probably haven't done a lot in free agency before that, which would not be good. But if, for example, it gets to be the new year, Shohei signs with another team. They don't get Blake Snell. They don't get any of those starting pitchers. They don't sign Cody Bellinger, any of those guys, even though I'm a little hesitant about Cody, but that's a topic for another day. In that scenario, I think offering Teoscar a deal like that would be okay. And if his market is not what he wants it to be, maybe he considers coming back to Seattle on a deal like that. But yes, I would rather give him a deal like that than $20.5 million for the QO. I think it's worth the risk. I do. Yeah. Look, if he declines it again, I'm all for it because that means you get the draft pick. So if he declines it, I'm all for it. My only holdup here The only reason I'm hung up on this is, in my mind, I feel like he is a player that is right on the brink of either considering to take it, because that is a very high average annual value for one year, or see if he wants to test the market. He probably tests the market, but I think there is a chance he would consider that QO. I don't know if he wants to kill his value for another year hitting at T-Mobile Park, though. That's... that's... Yeah, he may want to just cash out now. The other side of this is obviously... If he takes the QO and says, okay, give me one more prove it year in Seattle, and he has an even worse year, then teams are really going to be out on him. If he gets out now and gets his money now over an elongated period of time, that's just maybe what he prefers, especially if he goes somewhere like Cincinnati or the AL East. I, I'm going to conclude this with, with chuckling that still just realizing that the Mariners are actually in the revenue, revenue sharing recipients classification of, of this. I, I, I just don't believe that. I, I, I really have a hard time, hard time believing that the uh, that the Hatback Grill and Root Sports can't combine to 
out revenue the uh, the Marlins or the or the Orioles or the Rays or any of these other teams in here. I mean, one team just like clearly stands out from the pack. <laughs> I'm going to be quite honest. And the fact that I'm looking at the all other clubs classification here and two that stand out are the Nationals and the White Sox that are not revenue sharing recipients. You're leaving out that the Mariners get a bunch of money from Root for Trailblazers games, for Kraken games. Their attendance was an all-time high. Spend money, people. I like again. Well, we're the not attendance, like... the box office, they have to share. Okay, well, th- fair, but they still got a bunch of money from it. Right, but they have to. That money is all pooled and redistributed. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah fair. But especially the TV deal stuff with the, Root. The Root they money, re- they do not have to share. No, the, that's the, the halfback money, they do not have to share. They make a ridiculous amount of money off some of their products. We're not the crazy payroll Twitter people. Really, we're not. But that doesn't mean we're not sitting here to say, spend money this winter because this offseason is crucial and it something has to be done. Like w- This team needs major, major improvements on the offensive side of the ball, and you have the money to do it. Yeah, that that graphic did give me a laugh when I saw it yesterday. Well, we'll see what the official classification is, and we'll know a little bit more. I would say after the qualifying offer, that will the 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 draft pick they end up getting awarded if Teo declines it and he signs somewhere else, we will we will know for sure which category they fall into. And we should note, in case people are not aware, that the deadline to offer the player the qualifying offer is five days after the World Series, so some point here in the next week or two, even a little less than two weeks, we should know. And, and we'll have concrete information on what's going to happen with Teo moving forward. So whenever the World Series ends, the Mariners will have five days and we'll see if they offer it to him or not. Is there a deadline for them accepting it or not? Yeah, there is. I, I, I'm, I'm, bang, I'm blanking right now on what that date is. It's only a couple days after they're give, offered that QO. Right that they have to accept. I want to say it's like 48 to 72 hours. It's not a lot of time that they get to sit and stir on it. 